so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. This episode contains graphic depictions of violent crimes. Listener discretion is advised. Last weekend, a Sydney criminal named Warren Lanfranchi was shot and killed by police. It's 1981 and Sally Ann Huckstep, a 26-year-old single mother, sits across from Ray Martin on 60 Minutes, one of Australia's most watched current affairs programs. She speaks clearly and emphatically. With a piercing blue stare and a cigarette hanging from her right hand, she tells a story that Australia is not yet ready to hear. My ex-husband was a criminal. I paid the police many times for him because it's a way of life and it's the way you survive. Every word of it we now know is true. What did you say to Warren? What what were the last moments that you remember? He said he didn't know what time he'd be home, but if he wasn't home by six o'clock, then I'd know he'd been killed. Sally Ann's boyfriend, a man she loved, had been murdered the week before in broad daylight. She knew the perpetrator. Everyone did. The story had made it into the papers. But what had happened to her boyfriend wasn't reported as a murder. It was reported as brilliant police work. The man holding the gun was Roger Rogerson, an award-winning, highly respected New South Wales detective sergeant. No one had questioned his retelling of events. But Sally Ann, a heroin user, a sex worker, a young woman with a criminal record, decided to do the unthinkable. She told secrets that many had taken to their graves. She explained exactly what was happening and how the crimes currently ravaging Sydney were not as they might appear. She says that some police were also dealing in heroin. Sally Ann knew that speaking to Ray Martin was one of the most dangerous things she could do. She did it anyway. And eventually, she would pay the ultimate price. You surely can't stay in Australia if what you say is correct. No, I have to leave the country. Not only because of the police, but a lot of criminals are going to be uh, very upset with me. I've uh, upset the balance, but it had to be done. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with journalist Liz Hayes. Liz Hayes is a well-known reporter for 60 Minutes and the host of Channel 9's Under Investigation series, which last year uncovered never-before-seen interview footage of whistleblower Sally Ann Huckstep. Sally Ann Huckstep appeared on 60 Minutes in 1981 and she had a story to tell. Before we get into what that story was, can you tell us a little bit about who Sally Ann Huckstep was? Sally Ann Huckstep was a young girl who had uh, been raised in a middle class family in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. She's very bright, very smart indeed. She didn't cope well with her family's divorce, her parents' divorce. Uh, So at the age of 13, she ran away. By the age of 15, she had become a prostitute. Sally Ann Huckstep was a product of King's Cross, and that was at the time the heart of a lot of criminal activity. But she worked as a prostitute. Uh, She was astute and made her way through that maze of criminality. What prompted her that day to appear on 60 Minutes? What had been the lead up that meant that she was sitting there across from Ray Martin? Sally Ann Huckstep had fallen in love and she'd fallen in love with a criminal called Warren Lamfranchi. Warren Lamfranchi had actually met her as a prostitute. Prostitution brought them together. But he absolutely fell for her, sent her red roses, and she fell for him. They fell in love. And what had happened was that the love of her life had gone to sort out some criminal business, which I'm sure we'll explain later, which had been worrying both of them, and he didn't come back. 
In fact, he was shot in broad daylight in the inner city of Sydney by a policeman called Roger Rogerson. It was as a result of that that she just decided, I think, that enough's enough. There are rules of engagement in the criminal world. She'd been paying off cops nearly all her life as a prostitute and she knew the rules and an understanding had been determined on how Warren Lanfranchi, the love of her life, was going to deal with an issue that he had. It was going to involve money and, of course, it didn't go to plan. A policeman shot him dead. I think it was one step too far. It, I think, stole her life. She decided that the man she loved should not be cut down in such a manner, despite it being the criminal world. But there were rules of engagement and the police had not honoured their side of the engagement, is how she saw it. As a result, she decided to blow the whistle on what had been a long history of corruption within the police force in New South Wales. What was Warren Lanfranchi's criminal history like? What had he done up until that point? Warren Lanfranchi was a petty thief, a standover man who became quite violent. He lived in the world of drug dealing. He was a small-time drug dealer. And, of course, you know, in King's Cross, which was quite often the heart of drug dealing and prostitution, that's where he met Sally Ann. Uh, He had decided that Sally Ann was the woman he wanted to spend his life with too and had been planning on how they might escape Australia and start afresh. He too came from the underworld realm and I guess it was inevitable in one form or another that he and Sally Ann would cross paths. When Sally Ann sat down in that interview, it was explosive and it was about to blow the lid off sort of New South Wales police corruption. What exactly did she allege? What did she say in that interview that was so surprising to viewers? Well, for the first time, she told it like it was, that police were involved in criminal activity. She basically said that the drug squad was selling drugs. The armed hold-up squad were organising robberies. She told of her first-hand knowledge of corruption. She talked of paying off police uh, for 10 years, as did her former husband, who was also a criminal. So uh, what was shocking was she was alleging that the police force in New South Wales was rotten to the core. And that was pretty appalling news to hear. But back in the 80s, it was also fairly shocking. The bombshell was, which wasn't able to be released until later, the bombshell was that she alleged that the hero cop of New South Wales, the man that was set up to become the commissioner even, he'd been awarded, he had 13 medals for his policing, This was a poster boy for policing. Roger Rogerson was corrupt, and that not only was he corrupt, but he executed her boyfriend. Detective Rogerson has a reputation as being a killer. In fact, Warren was so terrified, he went and bought himself a gun and used to sleep with it next to the bed because we were terrified that Rogerson was going to find out where we were and come in and kill us both in our bed. Because the interview, as shocking as it was, it wasn't broadcast in its entirety because of issues of defamation. You were able on your program to show parts that hadn't been broadcast at the time. What were those parts? So she spoke quite candidly about Roger Rogerson and his specific involvement. Was it that that they couldn't show at the time? Yes, there was much of what she had said that couldn't really be shown because of defamation. I mean, it was a pretty big call to have ultimately a prostitute who admitted to paying off police, whose boyfriend had been gunned down, to say that the hero cop, the police force and a core of the police force that we all looked up to, that we were led to believe were there, our saviours out there on the streets, were corrupt, that they were on the take. But more than that, they were murdering. And it was a big call to put all of that out there. So she was able to tell her story. Uh, She was able to say that she believed that police had uh, shot her boyfriend. 
She was able to say she'd been paying off police. She was able to say the police took money, but she wasn't really, and we couldn't really, broadcast who. And when many people watched the program, they thought this woman is not going to live very long because of how incredible her allegations were and who she was getting into this game with. Why was that such an overwhelming response? You spoke to people on the program about it who said that was their sense. Why was it so serious for her to do this? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, you're a part of the network of corruption here. She was a link in that network of corruption in that she was a prostitute who paid to keep her, you know, her business going basically. The deal was you could stay on the street if you kept paying police. The moment she stepped out of the circle of criminality and told her story, told a truth, she broke the deal. And the deal was that if somebody spoke out like that, somebody was a whistleblower like that. She's a whistleblower. She was in danger and she was pointing her finger squarely at police, corrupt police, but at police, high profile police. That was never going to go down well. She was claiming police were part of the corruption, part of the cycle, part of the circle. And if she was going to break that, and she was alleging police murdered people, she had to know that by squealing, she was putting herself in the firing line. She not only had to know, she did know. And she stated that in her interview with Ray Martin. What did her testimony actually do? What was the result of her coming out? Because Everyone knew that Warren Lanfranchi had been killed. They thought that it had been done in a way that was entirely legal by a police officer who was very well respected. How did her coming out and speaking change the course of that story? Oh, it rattled the cage. Sally Ann's interview rattled the cage. It forced police to investigate themselves to a certain degree. But it forced questions. And in that time, there were already mutterings of corruption within politics and with police. There were already mutterings along these lines. But nobody dared to speak it from a place of knowledge. So it really did open up the box and it allowed a light to be shone in. It allowed other media to start poking around. It allowed questions to be asked. And it brought people from the public to speak up because, as we now know, the day that Warren Lanfranchi was gunned down, Roger Rogerson claimed it was in self-defence. But we know two shots were fired and it was the testimony of two women who lived nearby that changed the course of that, Mm. that made it clear that it wasn't quite as Rogerson had said. What was the response to that interview airing? Because as you say, Sally Ann openly admitted that she'd used heroin. She's a young woman who is going on and taking on these, you know, some of the most powerful people in the country. Did people believe her initially? Was this an open secret or was this like, this is too ridiculous to even be possible? There's no doubt that being a prostitute and a former heroin addict was the other thing Lamfranchi did was to get her off heroin. But no doubt, Roger Rogerson in particular was hoping that nobody would take any notice of her because, as he said in a later interview, she's just a common prostitute and therefore she's a lesser human being and therefore she shouldn't be believed. And I'm sure that for a long time there was just the hope that if we're pinning everything on this woman who has a career in breaking the law then nobody's going to take any notice. It's a hiccup. But in fact, we know it was the very beginning of the end of Roger Rogerson. But you know, anyone watching this would say, right, here's a man whom society might well call a thug, for want of a better word, pointing a finger at a member of the police force, saying that he's a major dealer in heroin. Why should anyone believe Warren? Well, it's common knowledge that the drug squad sells heroin. People find it very hard to conceive that uh, upstanding, upright members of our police force are corrupt. 
they don't want to believe it. It doesn't make you feel very protected. Was there, as you said, any corroborating evidence that they got to? So those two women who were there that day and heard what happened, what exactly did they say happened in terms of what they heard out their window when the shots were fired? They said that they heard two shots fired in quick succession. Roger Rogerson said that he had fired in self-defence and that he had testified that there was something like 11 seconds between the two shots. The women were able to tell uh, the court that that was not the case, that the shots were fired in quick succession. And I think the jury at the time accepted that Rogerson may have been operating in self-defence, but they did not accept that the second shot was fired, as he said, and indeed it prized open the corruption allegations because because it was executed, basically. He'd shot Lamfranchi in the chest and then shot him in the head. The testimony of those women showed that it wasn't a self-defence. It was basically, no, he executed him. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. I'm speaking with journalist Liz Hayes about the unsolved murder of Sally Ann Huckstep. How was Warren Lanfranchi coaxed there that day? How did he come to be standing across from Roger Rogerson? Well, Warren Lanfranchi's boss was a bloke called Arthur Nettie Smith, who at the time was this extraordinary character, frightening. You know, he was terrorising as a criminal in the 1980s. He happened to be Warren's boss. What had occurred was that Warren being the drug dealer and the thief that he was, he ripped off some drugs But he didn't know at the time that the drugs actually belonged to Roger Rogerson. So when he did that, obviously, as Sally Ann put it, they both knew that they were in peril. That was a dangerous thing to have done, to have ripped off Roger Rogerson, whom they all knew was part of the corrupt world. So a deal had to be done where Arthur Nettie Smith, who happened to know Roger Rogerson quite well, organised for a meeting in a back street in Chippendale. But at that meeting, allegedly, Rogerson had told Warren Lamfranchi that um, he had to bring $30,000, but he would also help him pull off a robbery and that he would tell him where to go and what to do, where he could easily pull off a robbery and that he wanted a cut of the proceedings of that robbery. But that's really how, how the story was told, that, you know, Warren was going off to make amends, basically, to pay back Rogerson. And then, you know, the sweetener was that, you know, he'd also conduct this robbery and Rogerson would get some money from that. Rogerson turned up with his, I think our former police commissioner said, with a posse, actually turned up with 18 men. And not all those men knew what the story was, but a very small number did know and they were part of Rogerson's circle. It was an extraordinary extraordinary ambush, really, and brazen on so many levels. So Warren goes, meets his boss, you know, Arthur and Eddie Smith. They wander off to meet Roger and very quickly it's all over. Rogerson shoots Lamfranchi and Nettie Smith, as they would say back in the day, decamped in a northerly direction. <laughs> he removed himself from there. It goes to show just how powerful Roger Rogerson was, that he could commit a crime of that magnitude in broad daylight, know he'd get away with it because of those connections that he had. And what happened next is that Sally Ann speaks on 60 Minutes, she's worried for her life, and then years later, something does happen. What ended up happening to Sally Ann Huckstep? Well, I I should just say to you, Roger Rogerson was the man with the badge. He could swagger into town, so that's why he could do whatever he liked. Nobody's going to call him out. He actually is the policeman. He's the hero cop, what's more. He was looked at as police commissioner material. No one's going to question that guy. So five years later, after everything had died down, basically, Sally Ann's no longer in the spotlight. She gets a call from home and she leaves. And some hours later, her body is found lying face down 
in a pond, Busby Pond in Centennial Park. She'd been strangled and drowned. It is without doubt the determination of investigations that followed that her death was at the hands of Arthur Nettie Smith and at the instruction of Roger Rogerson. If we know that, which, you know, every investigator knows it, why has neither of them been convicted for that crime specifically? Nettie Smith was recorded talking about having done this. But beyond that, there was no hard evidence. Beyond, you would think, amazing. Nettie Arthur Smith has actually talked of this in secret recordings. But it was not deemed that there was enough evidence to prove that either of them had been the cause of Sally Ann's death. It is one of the injustices, to be honest, because police officers, those given the job of investigating it all, say that's exactly who did this. I, I might add that Smith in those recordings talked of being scratched on the face by Sally Ann, and they did get DNA from Sally Ann's fingertips and they did send that DNA off to the UK and it came back as a weak match to Nettie Smith. It wasn't deemed strong enough. That's potentially where it ends because it was some years later that the police did that and so any other physical evidence was lost on the day. That recording that they had of Nettie Smith, what exactly did he say that he had done to Sally Ann and did he say what his motive was? Well, he said he was doing it at the instruction of Roger Rogerson. I mean, Roger Rogerson and Nettie Smith had a pretty cosy deal. Nettie Smith is six foot six, a very big, imposing, terrorising man, was in cahoots with Rogerson. And it was an arrangement that worked fairly well. But Nettie Smith basically said in those recordings that he enjoyed snapping Sally Ann's neck that it gave him some pleasure. Strangulation was something that he enjoyed doing. Uh, It was a fairly nasty recording. It's not the kind of recording that you would want to hear. It is violent, it is terrorising, and uh, it goes to the core of who these people are. What ended up happening to Nettie Smith? I think Nettie Smith died just recently. I think he's gone to maybe not heaven. But he was investigated for 14 murders. Uh, He was pinned on a couple of those. Sally Ann Huckstep was not one of those, but he was sent to jail for life. And how about Roger Rogerson? What was his fate? Well, Roger Rogerson was subjected to a number of investigations. In 1989, Roger Rogerson was charged with conspiring to murder Mick Drury. I mean, there was a serious concentration on Roger Rogerson. In 1995, the Wood Royal Commission was formed and police corruption was the investigation. Roger Rogerson was named as the central figure. In 1999, Rogerson was charged with perverting the course of justice and lying to the Integrity Commission and went to jail. In 2016, Roger Rogerson was convicted and sent to life in prison for the murder of a small-time drug dealer, Jamie Gow. Roger Rogerson has spent a long time now, in fact, they call him Roger the Dodger, he spent a long time dodging But the the law ironically finally caught up with him and he is now in jail for life. Drury, who was one of the names you brought up, appears on the program and he was an officer, I believe, who was basically there was an attempt to bribe him in uh, covering up some of the work that Roger Rogerson was doing. What did Drury do and what did that cost him? Um, Mick Drury was an undercover drug cop straight cop, the good cop. He had been across all of the drug trade and became aware that Roger Rogerson might have been involved in some drug dealings. Roger Rogerson became aware that Mick Drury might know and offered him a bribe. Mick Drury didn't accept that. He knew that that was probably not going to bode well for him either. It was a big deal at the time because for Mick Drury, again, who's going to believe him necessarily, he knew at that time the force of the law could be against even him. However, Mick Drury's at the sink washing up in his home. 
he's got his little children behind him in high chairs, I think, and and his wife is in another room and he is shot through the window by a hitman bloke by the name of Christopher Dale Flannery. Mr. Rentakill was his name. He was sent to kill McDrury, and McDrury believes that is at the request of Roger Rogerson. He has no doubt about that. McDrury survived that, and McDrury suffered terribly as a result of that. It was a terrible moment in policing when a police officer could be in his own home and be shot through the window as he was. But it started a very long uh, journey for McDrury to get justice for what he believes Roger Rogerson did to him. Finally, I wanted to ask, looking back at what Sally Ann Huckstep did and everything we know now in terms of the extent of that police corruption, what do you make of her coming forward? Do you just see it as a profound act of bravery that she knew what she was going up against and she did it anyway? There are many layers to this story, but the real thing that drove me to this was Sally Ann Huxted. We are in an era now where women should be celebrated despite their place in society. When truth is at the core of what you're doing, then this is a woman who deserved to be celebrated. I felt if it wasn't for her, we may not have learnt a lot about the corruption in New South Wales police at the time. We may not have known about what was really going on behind the scenes with some of our top cops. Sally Ann Huckstep did what she did out of love, but also out of frustration and a belief that enough was enough. She'd lost someone she'd found was very precious to her that she wanted a life with. And she'd always played by the rules of the game in the world of criminality as a prostitute, but she knew that the deal had been broken. I admired this woman because she was prepared to put her life on the line. She was the ultimate whistleblower. She really did know she would die. Most people around her knew it was foolhardy for her to do this. It didn't stop her. I don't know of any whistleblowers who would potentially come forward in the manner that she did with the knowledge that you will die because you tell this story. That is unique. And at a time when the world was probably not going to want to hear from a prostitute, she was amazing. And she was believable. Despite everything, when she went to air, there was a core of her that people knew was telling the truth. There was no point in her doing this. There was nothing in it for her. I think that's what really made people stop and go, you know what? She may be a prostitute. She may have been playing the game of paying off cops. She may have been in the the criminal cycle, the criminal world, but she's telling the truth. And she did, and she did pay the price. She was incredibly compelling and articulate and, as you say, believable. And, you know, when you think about her life and the experiences she must have had, to sit there with the confidence to speak in front of a camera and advocate for what was an incredible sense of justice in a young woman I think is pretty admirable. And as you say, she did that knowing it would cost her her life. It's a, an incredible moment. It's the ultimate brave act. It's the ultimate in bravery. I don't know anybody who willingly does that easily. This is a young woman who could have just disappeared. She could have just allowed herself to quietly go back to the street. She could have saved her life. She didn't have to do this, but she did. And in that era, at that time, she knew she would die, and she did. Thanks to our guest, Liz Hayes, for assisting us in telling Sally Ann's story. Liz is one of Australia's most respected journalists. She's been a television presenter with the Nine Network for just over 40 years and is best known for her reporting on 60 Minutes. 
She also hosts their popular Under Investigation series, a gripping investigative program that shines a spotlight onto unsolved crimes and mysteries. You can watch that free to air on Wednesday nights or stream it now on demand on Nine Now. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jesse Stevens, and my executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave us a review. It helps more people find our show. And if you want to find out more about the show, then don't forget to join our online community. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook and make a request to join.